This Faith and Finance podcast is underwritten in part by Sound Mind Investing. For more than 30 years, do it yourself investors have relied on SMI for proven strategies and trustworthy guidance. SMI helps people build wealth so they can provide for their families, prepare for the future, and give generously. Learn more at soundmindinvesting.org. John Wesley is said to have coined the phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness. Do your finances need some spring cleaning? Hi, I'm Rob West. Does your desk or office look like a paper recycling facility? Stacks of paper here, piles there. That disorder may prevent you from managing money wisely. Today, I'll tell you how you can do some spring cleaning, and then it's on to your calls at 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. This is Faith and Finance, biblical wisdom for your financial decisions. You know, John Wesley is also credited with the idea earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. Well, it's harder to do that if your financial papers are disorganized. You can start getting things organized by taking all of your stacks and piles of paper and organizing them into three categories. Those you don't need to keep, those you want to keep for seven years, and those you need to keep forever. Category one, papers you don't need to keep go into the shredder. If you don't have one, buy one that makes cross cuts. It's worth the small expense to prevent identity thieves from sifting through your garbage. Category two, papers you want to keep for seven years will usually be anything related to taxes. Make folders for those and keep them in a file cabinet, another worthwhile expense if you don't have one. Category three, papers you need to keep forever would include marriage and birth certificates, passports, deeds, and other documents related to property ownership. Keep those in a fireproof safe or safe deposit box. Now that your papers are in order, you can tackle some of the other items on your financial spring cleaning list. Do you have three to six months living expenses in your emergency fund to cover an unexpected job loss, medical condition, or some other financial calamity? If not, spring is a great time to start or increase your emergency savings. You want to keep those funds in an online bank to get the best interest rate, and you can automate the process by having a certain amount taken from each paycheck and put that directly into savings. Check your bank's website for details about automating your savings. That money won't show up in your checking account balance, and you know what they say, out of sight, out of mind. Now, tax season just ended, so it's a great time to think about your withholdings. If you have too little withheld, you could get hit with a penalty. On the other hand, a big refund means you're just giving Uncle Sam an interest-free loan with money you can put to better use through the year. So, how close did the amount you had withheld for taxes match what you owed? If you owed more than $500 or you're expecting a refund of that much or more, you need to fill out a new W-4 form to adjust your withholdings. This is especially important if you had any major life changes, such as more income or maybe a new addition to the family. You can get a new W-4 form from your employer or download one at irs.gov. And speaking of family members, you should also take a few minutes to look over the beneficiary designations for retirement or other financial accounts. If you haven't made any, now is the time to do it. A beneficiary designation will allow those assets to go directly to the person or persons you name without having to go through probate. Your next financial spring cleaning task is to pull out all of your insurance policies for life, health, home, auto, and anything else. Are they meeting your needs? You'll have to wait until open season to change health insurance, but others can be changed or replaced at any time. For example, are you driving less this year because you're working from home more? Alert your auto insurance agent of that change because it could well lower your premiums. If you made major purchases or changes to your home, you'll want to make sure your homeowner's policy covers them. It's a good idea to take pictures from different angles in every room of your house. That way you can show an insurance adjuster exactly what you lost in case of theft or fire. 
For life insurance, check to see if your policy provides a death benefit of at least 10 to 12 times your annual salary. If not, increase it accordingly. And by the way, you want the least expensive term insurance policy. Whole life policies mix insurance with investing, and you'll always be better off by doing your investing separately. Okay, one more item on your list. Check your subscriptions and streaming services to see what you might be able to cancel. You can actually download apps that will review all of your automatic bank debits for apps and show you which ones you no longer need. For streaming apps, if you're not watching them, cancel them. It can save you a ton of money. Well, that's your financial spring cleaning list. We hope you'll get started ticking off items right away. Your calls are next. Stay with us. We'll be right back. If you enjoy this radio program, you're going to love all of the many different resources waiting for you at faithfi.com and the FaithFi app. You'll find powerful wisdom, free podcasts, articles, videos, and more from leading voices such as Randy Alcorn, Howard Dayton, Ron Blue, and our own Rob West. Grow in wisdom and knowledge by connecting with a community of thousands of Christians striving to be good and faithful stewards at faithfi.com or by downloading the FaithFi app. What's most important to you when it comes to choosing your financial advisor? Someone who's aligned with your biblical values? How about someone who will take the time to explain your options? Certified Kingdom Advisors are professionals who meet high standards in competence and integrity and have been trained to offer biblical financial advice. To find a Certified Kingdom Advisor in your area, visit faithfi.com and click Find a CKA. Welcome back to Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West. We've got just three lines open, perhaps one just for you. 800-525-7000 is the number to call. Uh, let's head to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Corey, you're next on the program. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering, I have a house that I had for, well, actually what happened is I got married, okay? Uh, we moved into a house that we bought from her dad, and we still had that primary home of hers. Uh, we didn't rent it or anything. It needed work. Uh, so we fixed it up over the last six years. Uh, you know, new roof, new heating and air unit. And, and we finally got it done this past year when the market was so high. Thank, thank the Lord because it, it went up really high. And we, we made a lot of money, uh, more than what we could think we could make on it. But uh, so, you know, we, we cleared around $130,000. And I'm wanting to know how to go about this. How? What's the tax laws as far as uh, is that a straight up capital gains that I'm going to have to pay on this, or uh, can I write off my fifty eight thousand that we put into it and mm-hmm. all those type of things? Yeah, very good. Uh, so the first question is: Did you live in the house two out of the last five years as your primary residence? Well, my kids did, <laughs> but I can't say <laughs> I did. Okay. All right. If you if you could say that, and I understand you can't, uh, that would allow you to have uh, up to half a million dollars as a married couple in gains without paying any capital gains tax. But since you did not live there, you as a as your primary residence two out of the last five years, then it would be considered an investment property. And then it uh, the uh, as long as you held it more than a year, um, it would be a long term capital gain, which you know for most folks. Uh, that's going to be 15%. If you have, if you're married filing jointly and you have income between 89,000 and, uh, 550,000, uh, you'll pay 15% capital gain. If you have less than 89,000, you would pay nothing in terms of capital gains. Um, now in terms of establishing the gain, um, you would take the selling price minus that original purchase price, your cost basis. And then you could also further reduce it by certain improvements. And as we said, with the last caller, you'd probably want to check with a tax preparer just to determine exactly what could be considered an improvement that would reduce that cost basis versus what would be just general wear and tear. But generally speaking, if it's something that stays with the property, not maintenance, and you know, you've got wood that rotted around a window and you replaced it, not that kind of thing. But if you did something to improve the value of the property, uh, then that would be, you know, able to be um, reducing the cost basis. Okay. All right. So yeah, mm-hmm. as far as writing it off, it's not necessarily going to mean I can write the whole 57000 off. Uh, just because of certain things, you know, uh, even the heating and air unit may not be 
that situation because it, uh, well, it was an improvement from the old unit, you know, that was really inefficient. But yeah, that, it, that's uh, a good question. And, and that I would rely on your, your CPA's counsel to determine whether or not you could add something like that. Uh, so I wouldn't want to weigh in on that specifically, but I think this is the year for you to get some, some wise counsel as you establish that. Good news is, like I say, is uh, for most folks, it's either zero or 15% uh, capital gains, unless you're making over $553,000 if you're married filing jointly. So uh, it's it's uh, pretty reasonable, I guess I would say. Uh, I think capital gains rates, unfortunately, are headed higher in the days ahead. So you, you at least can enjoy that for the time being. Hey, Corey, thanks for calling today. We appreciate it. Uh, quickly to Miami. Hi, Bob. How can I help you? Yes, uh, Rob. I have uh, about 330000 in an IRA, and with I'm 72, and with required minimum distribution, it's only about 13000 a year. And to raise that, my income, I was considering an immediate annuity for like 100000 yeah. That yeah. would be 9%. 9% instead of about 4% I'm doing now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're solving for an income gap on your monthly income that would give you peace of mind to know that I've guaranteed and kind of shored up my budget uh, by now having this guaranteed amount, I don't have to think about the market, especially if you've got a couple hundred thousand in addition to that. Uh, that's certainly an option if you get a really attractive, uh, you know, uh, fixed annuity rate on that. Um, you know, I, I can't argue with that. Uh, the, I would just look at the potential that you could have by keeping full access to your capital, not tying it up in an annuity and investing it, uh, you know, with the goal of being able to maintain maybe a, um, you know, a withdrawal rate of around 4%, which, you know, at 330,000 is, you know, 13,000 a year, somewhere around a thousand dollars a month, a little bit more than that. Um, and you know, then you still have access to your capital, but if you want to take a third of it and kind of lock it in and you get a really good rate and that gives you some peace of mind, I'd say, go for it. That can be a great option. And it's one of the only cases where I would say an annuity may make sense, even though they're certainly not my first choice because of the loss of capital, the complexity and the cost. Uh, it's a good question though, Bob, we appreciate your call today, uh, to Covington, Indiana. Hi, Greg, go right ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, I got a question. You're talking about getting scammed on credit cards, too many credit cards, too much information out there. Do I need something like LifeLock on my accounts? Would that be the wise thing to do? Would you have an opinion on that? You know, I do, and I'm not a big fan of it. I mean, if somebody, if if one of your financial institutions gets hacked and they are going to pay for some sort of monitoring service for you, which often they will for a period of time, uh, you know, I would take full advantage of it. If it's something you're coming out of pocket from, it could be anywhere from, you know, 12 to $35 a month. I mean, it's, it's fairly expensive and it goes up after the first year and there's lower tier plans, but they're gem- generally not comprehensive and no family coverage. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, for the most part, it's not going to prevent you from identity theft. It's essentially going to monitor threats to your identity, alert you when threats are detected, which a lot of your credit card companies in particular and your bank will do that anyway. Um, and then they'll help you recover from identity theft. But all the steps are out there at ftc.gov and other places where you can get a lot of helpful free information about if you do find out that your identity has been compromised in some way, kind of what are the steps you take, everything from reporting it, uh, you know, getting a police report, letting the FTC know, uh, you know, changing passwords, closing, uh, you know, changing account numbers uh, on financial accounts. I mean, all of those steps are pretty clearly outlined. So from my standpoint, although it may give you some added peace of mind, and if you got some extra margin in your budget and that would give you uh, that peace of mind, then I'd say go for it. Apart from that, I would say it's an unnecessary expense. I appreciate that. And thinking along that line, would you have any, say, ABC suggestions, one, two, three musts to prevent identity theft? Say some common causes of identity theft that uh, we could, yeah. as public, uh, be on guard for maybe some things that we aren't doing that we should be doing or uh, keeping an eye on things better. I'd appreciate your comment on that. 
Yeah, I'd be happy to. So a couple of just general ideas. One would be freeze your credit. Uh, that's a pretty simple process. It's free. You'd have to do it with each of the three bureaus, Experian, TransUnion, or Credit uh, ex- ex- Experience, TransUnion, and Equifax is the third one. That essentially involves you putting a PIN number on your credit file so nobody can access that to open an account in your name without the PIN number to thaw it out. Well, if somebody's trying to fraudulently open an account in your name, they won't be able to provide the PIN number, and now the account doesn't get opened. I would never respond to any inquiries by phone or by email that are asking you to click a link or give out information over the phone. That's a phishing scam, and it's uh, they're very good at impersonating reputable financial institutions, so just don't do it. Don't click links and emails. Don't give information over the phone no matter who they say they're with. Use strong passwords. Change them often. And uh, don't ever use public Wi-Fi for your uh, transacting business. Hopefully that helps you, Greg. Thanks for calling today. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We are grateful for support from Praxis Mutual Funds. Praxis Mutual Funds has seven impact strategies that are designed to create positive real-world change. More information is available at PraxisMutualFunds.com. The fund's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses are contained in the prospectus and summary prospectus. This and other information is available at PraxisMutualFunds.com. Investments involve risk. Principal loss is possible. Foreside Fund Services, LLC. Are you struggling to fit your faith into your practice as a Christian financial advisor? The Certified Kingdom Advisor designation teaches you a step-by-step process to confidently deliver advice that aligns with Christian values. Discover the skills you need to help your clients make a kingdom impact. Get started today by enrolling in the CKA educational program at kingdomadvisors.com slash get certified. That's kingdomadvisors.com slash get certified. Welcome back to Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West. We're taking your calls and questions today. Let's head right back to the phones, Mount Pleasant, Texas. Hi, Lance. Go right ahead, sir. Um, I am 50 years old. Um, I am debt-free. House is paid for. Land is paid for. Um, I contribute around 15%. Well, it's actually 16% to my 401k retirement at work. Um, I my wife is a teacher. She is one year from being eligible to retire. Um, my tractor is on its last leg and dying. Long story short, I need to buy a new tractor. My yeah. work currently offers a program to where I could take a loan against my retirement and pay myself back at 9% interest. Is that a bad idea to use that money to buy that tractor? Yeah, what is the purchase price on the tractor? Uh, With the trade-in that I'm gonna have, there's gonna be about $15,000 difference. All right, and and you've, you know, you think based on where this 401k is going to eventually be, plus the um, pension that you'll have and any other assets you're able to sell off when you reach retirement, you should have enough to cover your expenses? Um, Not counting on Social Security with my current amount and with the pension amount and my wife's teacher retirement, we would be earning around $73,000 a year. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, typically I'm not a fan of this because the money comes out of the 401k and so therefore it's not, you know, working for you. Uh, So I'd rather you maybe ratchet down your new contributions and just use that to fund it. But it would require you to take on a loan, which, you know, you may not want to do. And I understand you have this enormous asset there. So I think given kind of where you're at, the fact that you're essentially debt free, uh, you've got this asset, you're paying it back to yourself. If you did have to, you know, if you separated from your company and it had to be treated as a distribution. It's only 15000 of a $750,000 portfolio. 
portfolio. So it's a pretty insignificant amount of money, relatively speaking, that you would have to recognize as taxable income. And if you're under 59 and a half, you'd, you'd obviously have to pay a 10% penalty. But that's not likely to happen. It's a pretty short payback period. And you're right, uh, you are paying that interest to yourself. So, uh, you know, that's a good thing. It's kind of a forced savings in a sense that you're, uh, you know, paying to yourself as you pay it back. So I think just given everything that I'm hearing and all the assets that you have, uh, I don't think that's a bad idea at all. I think the key is just try to get it paid back and paid off as quickly as you can. Thanks for being on the program. Uh, let's head to Chicago. Uh, Jaqueen, is it uh, Jaquiana? Is that right? Correct. You got okay. it right on the first try. Awesome. <laughs> How can I help you? Oh, hi. So I was just calling because I recently got introduced to something called a, um, I think it's an IUL. Yeah. But like an mm-hmm. index. Yeah. So I already have a Roth IRA set up. I had a 401k. I switched it off to Roth once I left one of my jobs. And so I did that. And as you know, it's losing money right now. Not a lot, but enough. But I was introduced to this IUL, and I was told that that's more secure than doing, like, the Roth right now because, I'm like I said, I'm losing money right now, and this IUL would be more secure, and I could actually do compound interest and borrow from it if I needed to, and it's more secure than yeah. the Roth IRA. And I just want to see, what, is that correct? Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, First of all, it's not a matter of whether the the Roth is performing on its own or not. The Roth is just the vehicle that gives you the tax-free growth. You can put any kind of investment you want inside a Roth. Uh, Typically, it'd be stocks and bonds. um, But even inside the stock portion, you could own precious metals through like an, uh, an indexed ETF of some kind. So, you know, it can do whatever you want. I mean, you could technically, you could short the market. So you gain money as the market falls if you wanted to. So it's really not a function of whether the Roth is a good thing or not. The Roth is a great thing because it's providing you tax-free growth. And, you know, at your age, you've got, you know, 25 years potentially before you're even thinking about retirement. And then if the Lord tarries and you're in good health, you're going to need probably several decades beyond that. So we're talking about, uh, you know, 25 to 45 years that this money could be in here uh, before you need it. So you've got a long runway. The question is, what are the investments to go in it? And that's where you're either going to win or lose in the short term based on the investments you select. But again, if we're properly diversified and we're playing the long game, you should do well. What's the problem with the IUL? Well, the problem is it's it's not as favorable on the tax treatment as the Roth IRA because, again, you're getting tax-free growth. Number two, yes, you get downside protection, but in exchange for that, you give up some of the upside. So there's caps on the returns um, to limit your upside, and that's That's how the insurance company makes money. So they're able to protect you from losing money, but you give up some on the upside. And really, when you look at the market going back to the 1920s, again, all those ups and downs, ebbs and flows, the way you make money is you know, in in some of those years and decades, the market's up dramatically. Well, if you don't have that in your portfolio because the insurance company is, in in a sense, throttling that for you, well, then you're not going to have as good a long-term results because you've given that up. So why would you invest in a Roth IRA and then deploy that in the market right now, given the uncertainty, given the volatility? Well, the reason is because the market's on sale. You know, when you go to the store to buy some clothes, you don't want to buy at full price. If you don't have to, you'd rather buy at a discount. And you could look at stocks today, which is just a small piece of ownership in a real company with sales and earnings. You could look at stocks today as selling at a discount. Now, could they go further down uh, after you buy them? Absolutely. And they probably will because I think we'll test our October lows of last year when we get into this recession. But you're not looking at it about this year or next year or five years from now. You're looking 25 years down the road for this money. And the very best place for you to build wealth, if we look at all the data going back to the 1920s, is not in an insurance product. It's in the stock market. Does that make sense? That does. Do you, do you recommend like I take some and put like invest a little bit in the IUL just to see how uh, that goes and then leave the rest there? Is- 
Best no, death I, is better. I, I wouldn't do that. I would buy insurance for death benefit. So the reason you get insurance is to offset a risk. So if you're married and you've got somebody depending on your income, you need a life insurance policy. But I'd get a term policy, not the, ind- the index universal life. I do your investing in a stock portfolio like a Roth IRA, and I'd keep insurance companies for life insurance for a death benefit to offset a risk and not for your long-term savings. That's just my perspective, uh, Jacquiana, and I hope it's helpful to you. But at the end of the day, I don't think that's your best option. Thanks for calling today. We appreciate it. Folks, that's going to do it for us. I have an amazing team that makes all this possible. Thanks to them and thank you. I hope you'll join us again next time right here on Faith and Finance. Faith and Finance is provided by FaithFi and listeners like you. 